Welcome to the Etsy AA News for Wednesday, October 30th, 2013. Halloween tomorrow, everyone. Who's your favorite character in the Star Citizen universe that you're going to be dressing up as? Me? <laughs> Nikki? Batgirl D'Angelo? Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, last week, sparked by the sales of the Hornet variants, we were able to push past the $24 and $25 million stretch goals. We're currently working on the 26th. So $24 million, we unlocked the public transportation system. So going from point A to point B got a lot easier for people that aren't going to have a lot of friends or might not be in an organization at the time. So there's going to be interstellar, interplanetary, and planetary travel in this stretch goal. They're going to have everything from maglevs to starships to get you from one place to another. In fact, I heard a rumor, or maybe not a rumor, but... Um, explanation. There might even be luxury liners, but we'll le let that for the future. At the $25 million stretch goal, which we unlocked just four days later. So last Wednesday, we unlocked the 24. At $25 million, we unlocked on Saturday. Two huge days, Friday and Saturday. People really love those Hornets. Two huge days, $450,000 a day plus pledged. Enhanced Alpha was unlocked for this one. And what that means is that they can, they don't have to stage the alpha anymore, which would have been U.S. servers coming on, uh, come online, then European servers and Asian servers, and they're also able to add another fifty thousand um, alpha slots. So that there's really good things coming about this. This is going to help all of us. More people on the alpha is better for the game. Um, more people on the alpha at the same time is better for the game. So. With servers all over the world, as long as they're interconnected somehow, so I could play with my friends in Europe, in Germany, and in, in England, or in Australia, you know, in the you know Asian market. I, I hope that they do that. I hope it's more like Eve and less like uh, WoW or Lotro or any one of those other MMO games. So this one's a biggie. So we've unlocked two other goals in the last week. The first one at the twenty-six million dollar. Um, stretch goal that's what we're working on right now and we're just about 40 to 50 percent somewhere in there by the time you watch this we're about 40 percent there um enhanced capital ship systems this one's pretty cool you know we already know that we're going to be able to do boarding parties and fight like in call of duty style or battlefield 4 style whichever one's your favorite game on the planets or i should say certain planets like lawless planets um, but now they're starting to move things to a different, you know, perspective. Like, what if you're the organization that has the control of one of the Bengals at the time, and you're being attacked by, you know, another org or maybe an alliance of orgs? So this one gives you the uh, opportunity to be be more helpful in commanding different subsystems in the capital ships, like damage control and. Um, any one of the other stations, science station, weapon station, whatever it might be. So this isn't in the game yet. This is what we're working on. And even after they're done, you know, after we're done attaining this goal, it's still going to have to be built into the coding. But this one's really interesting. And I, I think this is going to make it a lot more fun. Um, the $27 million goal. Now, at $27 million, we unlocked the... I think it was a Zion ship, or maybe it was a Vendul ship. I, I'd have to look at it. It's one of the two. It was a, um, as I look back, it was a Zion scout, okay? And had a really wild way of controlling the vessel, no maneuvering thrusters, just big thrusters that move in different directions. This one's going to unlock the Banu freighter, um, Merchantman, um, which is really sought after, after, you know, by the merchants in the Star Citizen universe. Not the Han Solos, they're the smugglers. We're talking about like the Ferengis of the Star Citizen universe. Really big ships, um, moving a lot of stuff between point A and point B. This is a biggie because there really isn't a concept yet, but there's going to be. And th this is giving us more and more technology. Now, I've seen a couple of interviews with um, Chris and other people these are not just reaches like they come up with a um, another million they go oh I gotta sit down and I gotta figure this one out what are we gonna do next these are well thought out these are pieces that Chris and the team always wanted to put in the um, game but we're far out there because they didn't expect to be making this much money this early so these stretch goals are just things that they already had on paper to do in the game 
that because we're so willing to throw down our whole hard earned cash on the game, they're able to implement them a little bit sooner. So a couple of other things that we could talk about. You know, we had the commercial and we had the, um, the brochure released for the Hornet, but there was still a lot of um, confusion. So they put out an FAQ for the Hornet last week. And the FAQ specifically answered questions like, why can't I see my Hornet? I didn't buy an upgrade. I actually bought a Hornet. I can't see it. Um, what about this arc light pistol that's in the Weekend Warrior package, like the one I purchased? Um, can I buy it? Um, don't fear. I mean, there's going to be so much available in-game when it finally goes live in that Voyager Direct catalog, um, virtual catalog, that you'll see the arc light and better handguns in there. Stealth upgrades on a Super Hornet. So these are all the things that people are asking. So it, it's, it's a good read. Go out there and look at it, all right? Friday hit, okay? And the first thing was um, we, we did like 450 plus thousand dollars in sales on the Hornets and other things in game. But there were two things that were released that day. The first thing was a high resolution gallery, which you can see the pictures behind me as we're going. Um, really incredible photos. I, I, I mean, screenshots. And I just love the artwork. These guys are incredible. And the second piece is for those of us that are actually subscribers. And if you want to know how to subscribe, just go to the pledge store and pick you the Centurion or Imperator. And they're essentially give you the, almost the same thing, except the Imperator has like a lifetime um, less expensive or, or VIP passes to certain events. And you get your name on a wall. Um, so these are, these are important because when we're subscribing and giving our 10 or $20 a month, they're producing things like Jump Point. And Jump Point is one of the key things that I like. And I showed you um, the brochure, and now coming up in back of me right now is going to be the Jump Point 11 that's going by real quick. Jump Point 10 um, featured the Hornet. And then later on, um, you know, when that came out the last Friday of September. And then in October, we got to buy the variants and see the upgraded Hornet. Um, Jump Point 11 features the MISC Corporation. And the Freelancer, which is one of my favorite ships. I don't own one right now. Wink, wink. <laughs> um, I don't own one right now. I did at one point, but I upgraded from that to the Constellation, which is just my favorite ship in the game for multi-person. Um, I'm starting to like the Avenger, and you'll see why later on in this episode. But um, to get up, back on, off that tangent, they released the Hornet um, full work in progress in Jump Point 10, and then you got the Hornet variants. So do I let my mind wander and say sometime in November, we're going to see a freelancer variant sale? I don't know. Only CIG could tell us this, but I've got my fingers crossed. So um, I, I, I'm highly loving this game so far. So um, it's not even out. I just love being part of it. So one of the things that I want to talk about is going to be the lore builder excerpts that have been coming out, segments that have been coming out on the main site. There's been two so far, and I, I want you to take a look at this because it gives you an opportunity to be in the development part of the game. They already know what they want to do with racing, but they're putting it out there, and it's our opportunity to put feedback, um, to give feedback for this, and I'm really excited that they're including us in this piece. So please take a look at that and go out there and see what that's all about. Um, oh, I made a mistake last week. I can't find anywhere out there that said the LN was only going to be a um, limited sale. I think it's here for ever. I'm not sure. I, I can't find any information either way. I just think I misinterpreted it because of all the issues that were going on during CitizenCon. So there's no rush to go out and buy it. I think you're gonna be able to buy it forever, which makes me wonder why would anyone buy an MR when you could buy an LN? I don't know. It, it's just one of those things. Maybe it's just somebody that wants to spend 25 on the game instead of 35, which I totally 100% support, unless that's 45. It's 35 for the ship, 45 for the package. That's it. All right, so, um, 
I want to talk about um, one other piece because I just mentioned that that area about the um, lore builder and being able to take part in helping to develop this game. So there is a whole ask a developer section. So if you want to know about what's going on in the game, you can put a question out there and they'll answer it. So this leads to this part. Idris M and Scythe were one-time sales. They were the, if you buy this, it's never going to be out there again. And that's it. Just, you know, you buy it now and we're not going to put it out there again. So a troll started something saying, hey, look at this. You know, CIG is going to put this out for sale. They're just money hungry. Look at them trying to grab all of our you know, money. It's another $3 million they're going to make off of this. And, you know, it, it caused a couple of threads, one in particular that I'm thinking of, and I'm not even going to point at it. I'm not going to put it up here. But the person started this thread, got really upset with CIG and other people, and it was without even trying to validate the rumor. 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 <laughs> I work for Apple. I understand rumors. Validate your rumors. We are part of the development process, and I don't think a lot of us get that. We're giving our feedback, we're giving our input, we're helping to structure the systems in this game. If you get something like that and you see it and it pisses you off that much, you're way passionate about this game and that's a good thing. Go to the Ask a Developer forum. Here's the address. <laughs> and put your question out there and validate it. That's all it would have taken. And I'm not preaching or saying anything bad. I'm just trying to show you that this is unprecedented that we have this transparency and this communication from a company like CIG. It's never been done before. So I also want you all to um, just think about one thing. You know, every Friday is Wingman's Hangar, and there are places throughout the forums that you could put your questions there also. So look for the episode blank wing, wingman's hanger questions and get them out there because, um, you know, it's really informative. They're really fun. They're funny at times, but that's another thing that we would never have from another game in uh, development. I think the only time I've ever seen it by another company is now with uh, Sony Online Entertainment is doing it with EverQuest Next. So that's pretty cool. Well, that leaves me... No more news. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you guys two things. And first, I'm going to tell you, you know, the segment's coming up next, the Ellis system. I love racing. And I'm dying for my M50. I can't wait for those to go on sale someday. Maybe I'll get a Christmas present. Um, but I've got the Ellis system coming up. And yes, I'm including a star map of sorts. I don't have a 3D one I could put up. And then I'm going to be doing the Avenger. I love the Avenger. It's quickly becoming one of my favorite um, ships. Can't wait to paint it. Um, the all white beaten up finish reminds me of buying it like a police auction. Um, but it leads me to this next part. I don't own every ship and I'm not going to get loaners from CIG. It just would be unprecedented and that's not gonna be good. So some people have said, hey, you know what? I'll loan you one of my ships. And I'm having issues with gifting right now. I can get things from you, but when I gift out, it doesn't work, which is highly unusual since I created a second account and I gifted my Avenger over there for today, but I can't gift it to other people. I've tried two. Um, so hopefully that gets fixed in the future. But if you could watch this video and see the cut scenes I get, somebody could shoot video of a F7C-S and an F7C-R. I'd love it, but hopefully I get this fixed by then and I can get with somebody and borrow their ship for a day and return it. So next week I'm doing the F7CM. So I'm going to do each ship individually and with the F7 series they'll be um, reduced in um, length so I don't have 15 minutes, you know, 45 minutes of ships by the time three weeks is up. At the end of this, like every other episode, is going to be Confessions of a Star Citizen Attic. I would love to have your input in this in a different way. I'm getting the written um, confessions from the subscribers. First question to you, all of you, is do I put a thread out there in general chat 
do I ask people to go and find it inside the fan sites or do I just leave it the way it is? Okay, so you could send your confessions into the addicted gamer at gmail.com. You could send them to me as a personal message or you can post them in the form, whichever way you want. All over the back of me right now are confessions, you'll see that. And I want to be able to include yours. I'd love to have audio and video from people. So for those of you that are gifted enough to have wonderful voices or to have the ability to shoot a quick little, you know, webcam video, please, I, I would love to have input in that way. I don't mind reading them. I really don't. But I think it could be more fun if I heard the actual citizen speaking their own confession. That's all I have for today. Tomorrow's Halloween. Don't forget to dress up. Um, and... I will be back with news next week, the F7CM, and a couple of other little um, surprises, I hope. Thank you all. I'll talk to you next week. Bye. You have selected the Ellis system. If speed could paradoxically be represented by a fixed point in space, then that point is unquestionably the Ellis System. Home of the Murray Cup, the most famous racing event in the galaxy, Ellis is a star system that plays off its reputation to any tourist or other visitors who pass within a light year of the outer worlds. Despite this, Ellis is actually a very interesting star system on its own merits. From hordes of indigenous life forms that are unlike anything present anywhere else in known space, to an economy based on something other than ship part construction, to the sheer number and variety of planets present in the system, Ellis is worth at least one voyage. Cosmologically, Ellis is an F3V yellow star with an especially thick green band, allowing an unusually high amount of human habitation. The system is located in a highly developed region of UEE space with strong jump ties to Nexus and Killian. Politically, it is a corporate-owned star system, although this is more trivia than an actual issue of governance. Despite its association with racing, Ellis has never been a manufacturing powerhouse. Instead, it exports unrefined minerals and seafood to other populated systems in the local star cluster. Inner Planets Ellis 1 and 2 are typical inner system uninhabitable worlds. Ellis 1 is a protoplanet that orbits so close to the star that it is frequently caught within solar flares. Miners consider Ellis-1 the ultimate tease. Advanced scanners have revealed that the bubbling magma surface hides a fortune in rare minerals, but there is no shielding technology yet available that would allow a mining crew to access them. Dozens of pilots and crews have been killed in the attempt. Ellis-2 is shrouded in a thick, smoggy atmosphere. The surface is barren and otherwise uninteresting, although the constant severe storms are an attractive diversion for observers. Inhabitable Band Green, Campos, and Noble Green, Ellis's third planet, is the most recent to be terraformed, located on the edge of the system's inhabitable green zone, hence the imaginative name. The world was purpose-constructed as a resort world to cater to the visitors interested in the Murray Cup. A terraformed ocean world, the planet is dotted with luxury towers and mega resorts. To preserve the world's elaborate underwater reefs, only a single landing zone is allowed in the coastal city of Edu. Due to the fact that green was terraformed, it has no native sea life. Attempts to transport species from Campos and Earth have met with abject failures. Alice 4 was the first world settled in the system, and it remains the most populated planet. It is also the only planet in the Ellis system with an economy that revolves around anything but racing. Campos is a high-gravity ocean world stocked with all manner of sea life. The planet itself is named after a particularly large sea creature, though not one of the many whose harvested meat is available for export. Campos's high gravity also gave rise to the evolution of flat cats, which formed the basis of a brief fad in the UEE core worlds. 
The world is frequently called seahorse by the locals, so named for the appearance of some of the high-gravity sea monsters harvested by the native fishermen. The third of Ellis's populated planets, Noble, Ellis V, is a mid-sized forest world. The planet is largely unremarkable with corporate dictates requiring that most of the surface be preserved as is. A single spaceport near the southern polar region allows visitors to explore a beautiful landscape reminiscent of an undeveloped Earth. Two moons make for an especially beautiful landscape at night, although there is a consistent fear that urban development will spread on the world to support even increasing number of race fans traveling to the system. Undeveloped Worlds Ellis 6 sits just outside the Green Band, a rocky terrestrial world that is currently being used by the UEE for research into human habitation. The hope is that terraforming techniques will expand to the point that planets farther and farther from a star will be able to someday support a human biosphere. A small science station is in geostationary orbit for this purpose, and the population of scientists are always eager to purchase luxury goods to while away the time spent at their thankless tasks. Ellis 7 and 8 are similarly uninhabitable worlds. 7 features a highly corrosive atmosphere that can be damaging to ships entering local orbit. Ellis 8 is the smallest full world in the system an uninteresting rock with a limited atmosphere. Gas Giants The Ellis system features two gas giants, Ellis 9, a.k.a. Walleye, and Ellis 10. Walleye is the largest of the two and has been completely commercialized as a fueling world. While Walleye is most famously recognized as a pit stop for racers, most of the time it is the site of impressive queues of freighters and warships waiting to take on fuel. Long-haul transports making the Earth Pinecone Run frequently begin at Walleye, and a variety of rest stop facilities have grown up in orbit. Ellis 10, Bombora, is a smaller gas giant with an extremely turbulent atmosphere. Scooping fuel can be extremely dangerous, and pilots are advised to avoid any such attempt. On the other hand, it is a chance to skip the wait at Walleye and refuel your ship at no cost. Outer Planets the eleventh planet in the Ellis system was famously destroyed in a collision with its moon. The world was uninhabitable and astrophysicists had long been charging its apparent demise. Nevertheless, the impact resulted in an extremely dense debris field, which pilots are advised to avoid at all costs. Outlying regions are a reasonable source for minerals, though with gravity having already begun the refining process. Ellis 12 named Judica, is a small frozen ball in space, the site of the occasional ice mining expeditions and little else. The outermost planet in the system, Ellis 13, is known locally as Pinecone due to its strange shattered rock surface. Pinecone is rich in minerals and is a popular destination for long-haul miners, many of whom transport ores all the way back to Earth itself for resale. Welcome to the first look at the Aegis Dynamics Avenger. Now I did do a quick look, which was more of, hey, look at this, this is the model, and this is what it does, and I threw up some specs. But I wanted to do a much slower, much more detailed look at the Aegis Dynamics Avenger. And what I did is I started a new account, sent my ship to that account, just so I could show the ships in their own hangar. And I wish I wrote down the viewer's name that told me to do that because it was such a great idea. That way when you get a ship, you can see it here. Or I should say when a new ship comes out, you can see it here in its home hangar if you're only going to have one ship. This is now in a package. So if you want to have the Aegis Avenger as your only ship, you can do that. Before, it was only available as an add-on ship, which meant you'd have to have an Aurora, or a 300i, or a Hornet, or a Freelancer, or a Constellation, in order to own this particular model. But now you can have it in the Advanced Hunter, or as a standalone add-on ship. So the Avenger had a long career as a frontline fighter for the UEE. It is a beast. It has lots of armor a TR-5 
thruster, which it needs because it's one of the heaviest fighters in the game at 32,000 kilograms. The unit itself right now has an undesignated engine, an undesignated um, thruster. Right now we know what model thruster is going to be standard on this, but we still don't know who makes the thruster that it comes with. It's got a very unique look to it and probably the best visibility out of any canopy in the Star Citizen universe to date. I think the 300i series comes a close second. So I'm going to start moving around this little baby and we're going to look at certain points. You can see the huge ducts above the uh, fuselage kind of blended into the body like a stealth fighter would be. And there to suck in hydrogen in interstellar space to add more fuel to the unit. As we move around to the front view, you are going to see this very large Class 1 cannon. Again, this is a preliminary look. We do not know what the final stats on this cannon are going to be. But it looks like a laser repeater as it has three barrels right now. And it's pretty, uh, pretty threatening right there. Um, being that it's right in the center, it's going to have pinpoint accuracy. So when you're behind somebody, you're going to be able to open up with that and really take out some shields and hopefully take them down real fast. There's still a placeholder, I hope, of a stairway to enter this. I'm hoping that this is done away in later models of the ship and they figure out a way to actually have a ladder built into the unit. I think this is ugly and takes away from the beauty of my ship, but for now it works quite well. As we're moving around to the starboard, I think this is, wingtip, left to starboard, right? We are seeing a little bit more detail because I've gotten closer. They show some wear and tear. This is something that was probably bought at an auction by me. <laughs> think of like a police cruiser. Um, we're going to come in just a little bit tighter over here, and we're going to look at the Class 2, I believe this is. Now, these are Class 1. This is a Class 1 weapon right here. So, this is a laser cannon. And this is a Class 2 hardpoint. Right now, we're using a drop tank. Okay, drop tanks for extended range and system. And there's our cannon. We're going to go under it over here because I think this is a good area to look up at one of the thrusters. They're listed as TR-1 right now. TR-1s are the ones on the 300i if you own one or if you want to go back and look at my 300, sorry, my 325 review. They're tiny. This looks more like a TR-2 and I would gather that that's what it's going to be. To move this big giant ship, I don't think TR-1s would have worked. We're coming around the landing gear side, and you can see the dual landing gear. Again, something this heavy is going to need a lot more uh, weight distribution across multiple wheels in order to hold up on a standard tarmac. And look up top, see the incredible detail work that they've added to this spaceship already. There's another thruster. And we're going to just walk our way back and look at the big control surfaces. So in atmospheric flight, probably has some pretty good um, maneuverability. Not high maneuverability, but pretty good. I think the angled wingtips make up for the smallish rudders on top. To me, the rudders don't look like they're uh, proportioned for a ship this size, but maybe that's what they're doing. You've got three. Here is the tremendous exhaust for the TR-5. It's a gorgeous ship and pretty much not like the other thrusters in the game. And there you can see the four weapons points on the wings. 
Different from all other fighters, you have a cargo area over here. And to go slow, I actually have my guy crouching. That's why I'm going so slow. I hate moving fast when I'm doing these things. So we're going to come up in here. The incredible detail work shows some fuel lines that are just sitting here. I'm hoping that these are either electrical connections to, say, my... Uh, putting a jail cell in here or maybe connections to a jump drive that I'll have in here and of course we have the well radioactive material sign I guess I'm not sure or titanium take a look at the inside of this thing it's kind of ugly oh, it looks like we've patched a hole over here got a crack well, this area isn't, uh, I wonder if this area is even receives, well, there's vents on the ground. I was going to say, I wonder if this area even receives any kind of a uh, atmosphere when, pressurization, when you're in space. So we're going to come down it, and we're going to walk around the port side wing. See another huge maneuvering thruster. And of course, like civil aviation and general, you know, and uh, air carriers today, you have the uh, lights, but I'm not sure if they're set up right on this one. So we're just going to come around it, and I'm going to start talking about this a little bit some more, you know, a little bit more. So the Avenger started off as a fighter and ended its career as a probably reserve fighter and also a trainer in the UEE. It was purchased by multiple police forces throughout the universe or our galaxy and then found its hands into, you know, found its way into the hands of bounty hunters. So these ships have been road hard and are pretty old. Not sure if they're showing us new ones. This one does not look like it's in the pristine condition that the 300i series is in. As a bounty hunter, your job is to take out your mark, and if you capture him, you need to take him back. So this unit has two seats. You would put him in cuffs, maybe in stasis, maybe drug him, not sure. But you would put him into the back seat over here, which is probably why there is absolutely no way to use the controls back here. As a trainer, I would have expected there to be controls back here. But even back here, I long for there to be controls because what if I have a uh, organization and my job in the organization is to check pilots out for escort duty and I want to go see how well they fight. Maybe I want to go flying with them. And I would come into this particular jet for handing them over a Hornet and check them out. The new Hornet has uh, front and back, the Hornet F7CM um, controls, but this particular unit does not. All right, so we're going to get into the pilot's seat, and it does show its age. It doesn't have all the uh, pieces that the 300i series or the Hornet has, it's more in line with what the Aurora has. Um, beat up controls, kind of all scratched. Not the LN, not the LX, but the Aurora M MR, I think is what they call it. So we're looking at the uh, three MFDs and the display over there. There is no placeholder for the heads up display yet. I would expect it to be there. I'm hoping that you could add avionics upgrades, not to change pretty much this layout, but maybe change the HUD and what appears on the HUD. As we move the controls, you've got two. I'm wondering if it's a six point axis. Left uh, one works throttle and yaw, and right one works pitch and elevator I'm not sure 
Fitch and something else. There's got to be, yeah, pitch and roll on one side and yaw and thrust on the other. Maybe that's the case because it doesn't have a typical throttle. I think the only ship I re really think it has a throttle is the Hornet. It's got incredible visibility, like I said, the best visibility out there. And I'm thinking it's going to have some pretty decent maneuverability. Probably not carrying huge shields, but it definitely has a lot of armor. The actual model isn't complete yet, as we have decals that are reversed. But we've got a beautiful ship with a lot of detail on it as we look back. It's one of the lowest the ground ships in the game, meaning it's one of the few ships that you don't have a problem getting up on top of if you wanted to. You can just jump right up on the wing. Um, hardest one for me to actually get on the top of was the Constellation. It's kind of like a jumping exercise in one of the uh, Star Wars Jedi Knight games or maybe uh, closer to what you do in... Uh, well, we'll just leave it at that. So the ship is going to be gorgeous in-game, and I'm hoping to be able to add your own personality to the paint job. I'd love to see a more pristine paint job on mine. But one thing I can tell you is it does leave a huge area for nose art over here. This would be great to have the shark teeth on. <laughs> and maybe eyes right there. And look like a snake, like the cobra. So this is the Aegis Dynamics Avenger. And for those of you that have taken advantage of purchasing it, well, I think you've purchased a pretty gorgeous looking ship that will do well to protect the Aegis Dynamics Retaliator. All right, so I'm just going to look around the business hangar since I haven't done this for a while. This one has no upgrades at all. I've had a constellation for a while, so I haven't seen any of this. So there's no upgrades at all in mind. So no trophies, no workbench, which would go on the other side. No lamp, which I think every one of these should come with a lamp. Of course, as soon as I got in here, I put on the uh, I put on the outfit for the freelancer because I really think I need hair. Being a girl, you know, <laughs> having a <unique> guy body. <laughs> um, this is the configuration table in the business hangar, of course. Step back a little bit. Hold down the tab key to use. And you'll notice that the Avenger does not show up in it. This is the first pass on the Avenger. It's still a work in progress more than any other ship. So we don't have that yet. Maybe with the next version of the hangar. So we're going to get out of this. We're going to look at our two billboards. The one on the right is looping the Aurora LN commercial. As the Aurora is the most widely purchased ship, that is a pretty decent way to, uh, decent one to show off. For everyone that bought the MR package, I believe $10 gets you up to the Aurora LN. You just buy the upgrade. And of course, over here, you have the UEE poster. Be part of something great. It's kind of like a U.S. Navy ad. This is important because it reminds you that Squadron 42 is a important part of this whole universe. You gain citizenship, which means notoriety, reputation, lower prices, by completing the Squadron 42 campaign. So I'm going to end this preliminary look at the Avenger with staring at, well, let's do this the right way. We'll close the rear end. And looking at the probably the best rear view of any of the ships in the game. This is just a gorgeous ship. 
Next time on Star Citizens Addex Anonymous, we will be looking at the F7CM. If anybody has an F7CR or S that they'd like to shoot some video of for me to do a review, I would greatly appreciate that. I can't accept any gifts right now as my gifting seems to be broken on my account. So if someone sent me a ship, I wouldn't be able to send it back to you yet. So that's all I got for you. Thank you for watching, and I'll be back soon. My addiction began like anyone else, sitting around with some virtual friends, and somebody pulls out and passes around the robertspaceindustries.com URL. After a euphoric experience watching the sizzle reels and reading the available information, I pledged for a Rear Admiral package. I went to the hard stuff right off the bat. Immediately after this time, I had hip surgery that laid me up for six weeks. Now thinking back on that time, all I can pretty much remember is the hazy memories of ship stats and wingman's hangar shows, time spent recovering. It was about a week into my hip recovery time when I decided to buy a 315P and hook my spouse up with a freelancer package at the same time. A couple of days later, I talked myself into the High Admiral package to get the Aurora LX and the 350R. I kept my 315P, of course. It was shortly after this that my spouse's account purchased a High Admiral pledge and attempted to gift it to me. This was a five-day nightmare with support, transferring, melting, etc. A short time later, I upgraded to the Grand Admiral package for the Shiny. I kept my 315P shortly after I acquired a Caterpillar and a Cutlass, as well as put myself down for the Starfarer waiting list. I also picked up an Avenger and a 315P for my spouse. I printed off the brochure so they could pick. Eventually the waiting list paid off with a shiny new Starfarer. Then came the anniversary, and that brought with it a Gladiator and a Retaliator. It was shortly after picking up a retaliator that I started fixating on the address. I read everything on it. I studied every picture and dreamed of my friends and I having many adventures aboard it. After a time, the Space Marshal package started to look acceptable and the next logical step. So approximately six weeks after buying my Rear Admiral package, I melted my Grand Admiral package, a gladiator, and moved up to the Space Marshal. This was pure insanity, of course. This lasted for about a week, with some nightmare buyer's remorse and unchecked excitement. It was hard to sleep those first few nights. During this time, the Hornet reveal kept getting delayed and delayed some more. This prolonged the agony of trying once and for all to put everything to bed. After all, you have to defend your ship and fill those hangar slots, don't you? Finally, the day of the Hornets. I had the Hornet page auto-refreshing every 30 seconds. I would know the moment they were available. Then the moment came. The three main packages appeared with LTI in the name. I quickly clicked on the Weekend Warrior package to see what came with it. Oh, a shiny gun! I backed out of the page and checked the other two packages. In the meantime, the standalone ship and upgrade packages came out as well. Then, horror! As the LTI versions vanished, and only the regular versions remained. I clicked on the regular Weekend Warrior package and noticed that lifetime insurance was listed as one of the options. I knew I had but seconds to buy it, and quickly checked out and made the purchase. There simply wasn't time to melt any other packages. By the time I had completed checkout of my package, the LTI line option in the store version had been replaced with the limited 6 months insurance. Cringing, I went to my hangar and checked the contents of my package. Lifetime insurance was still there. I had done it, my first victory with my Hornet. A LTI Super Hornet was important to me because my Space Marshal Pledge package came with LTI, the only LTI I could buy myself. I purchased one of the Super Hornet upgrade packages to upgrade the basic Hornet that came in my Space Marshal Pledge to give me two of the Super Hornets, both with LTI. It was a lucky day indeed. Then I had to explain to my spouse why I had spent another $200 or so. My sweetie looked at the store screen 
showing all of the available Hornet models and was quiet for a few moments. Then simply said, I wanted the black one, and with a grin walked away. My addiction was officially sanctioned. So that brings us up to today. I had melted my Avenger and my Cutlass earlier to make way for new options. Now thinking it's only another $75 to get back the full Avenger package, it's so difficult to be strong. The Space Marshal Forum title scares me a little. So I chose the Tamer Lieutenant Commander title. It became available with the Space Marshal. Between my spouse and I, we are going to need 10 character slots. We still need a few more. During this process, my dear friends have also been hooked, some having received gifts of basic packages that have now returned them as they purchased larger pledges. All of my friends have at least an Origin 300i, and it's quickly looking like each of us will have a hornet of some description. Will this madness ever end? That's my up-to-date tale. I hope it helps some of you avoid the pitfalls of my plight. Just get the Space Marshal package right away to save yourself the trouble.